Well, so um, I'm going to share with you a couple examples. I usually talk very quickly, so I should really get through these three examples with you need. But um, so these were examples that I used in my Math 100 summer course. And so I had a small number of students, so I was able to kind of brainstorm ideas and um, implement them. And I was also at the same time working a little bit with this, with the, um, the assessment, this AACU assessment, and using the rubric to assess um, students not from our university but from outside. So I was kind of seeped in this rubric. So I really directly used the rubric in my assignment design and evaluation. So this was the first assignment that I used for my students. So they were doing two things. One just very basic um, topic that we started with is units, manipulating units, using units, and problem solving. And then also relative change, so percentages and, um, and those types of things. So these are both um, the kind of content of this problem. Um, but, if you, it, but in real world, one of the nice examples of having real world problems is that units are bonkers or, you know, so there's parts per million and micrograms and pounds per year and they're converting it into week. And so just all of these real world problems that arise when you want to sort of manipulate the data arise kind of already in these very simple examples. So I have them compare mercury levels found in different fish common in Hawaii and I used FDA guidelines and also I found some research for more of the uncommon fish, um, but that are common here in Hawaii. Um, and so I have them sort of compute how much mercury is in a pound of all three kinds of fish, and you see, compare the different fish, um, use the FDA guidelines, so how much ahi could you eat versus salmon. Um, and that to me seemed very low in practical standards. It was a much lower amount of ahi than a lot of local students would eat at the time. And so I wanted also them to compare it to sort of a known case of mercury poisoning, which is one extreme. Um, so they compared it in the Minamata disaster. And so um, what would it be, how much mercury might you need to have a really serious case of poisoning? So they could get this idea of scale, right? Um, and then also the rising levels of mercury and how that would affect. And, um, so then, so they do this in small groups. And they do the worksheet, and, um, and then what they have to do is a write-up. And so I asked them to give a summary of the findings of, that they, from what they did, and use at least five different particular computations, so five different numbers in the text of what they presented. Um, and it was a one-page summary, so this, you can see from the worksheet there's kind of lots of topics. So some picked up on different parts of what they wanted to explain. Uh, and then I asked them to give a recommendation. How much fish do you think people should be eating? And support it with quantitative data. So here I want them to be looking at interpretation and communication. And I think some people may have come in late. Oh, I wanted to give, oh, if you haven't. Don't depend. Yes, on. yeah. So the last page, um, I, you can see the rubric. And also I gave them explicitly like what one, two, three and four, what these different levels of the rubric are. So it's sort of like, what would be a good example? And then I was able to then say, you know, you have a, if you got three out of four, for example, and I give them a little clue, you know, you did this correctly, maybe next time, instead of saying less, you should eat less fish or you should eat more fish, put some quantitative, how much less or how much more, things like that. So I'm gonna give you some examples of what students responded. So here, this is one of um, a slightly weaker student, but I thought it was kind of a nice example. So this is a really baseline um, sort of interpretation. So if you consume a pound of mahi, you're taking 80 milligrams of mercury. It's odd, ahi is 160. Um, everyone loves poke. <laughs> um, slow, you know, you wanna slow down, downgrade back to half a pound. Um, and then here, she, I like this, that she was saying maybe you could have salmon because salmon was one of the lower ones. And then she also added on, look, don't eat salmon poke because that's gross. <laughs> so that was kind of nice. <laughs> um, but she also, actually, I kind of wish I added, she also did something that, was, um, that a lot of students do, which is not great, which is that if you eat more, you will get mercury poisoning. So she really wasn't getting the point of my second, but this is the first project, so I, you could go back to well, 
there's different levels in eating a little bit more, how confident are you that you're gonna have poison? Yeah. Exactly, yeah, this is an excerpt from it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so here's another, um, which one is this one? Okay, so this was a student who's actually um, from Japan. She was a, a, a visiting student, so she really picked up on the Minamata disease and talked about that a lot. And so her, her, her language is not super great, but her reasoning is really, really nice. So she discusses that if her, this was an important part of her weight, this is how much she can, of ahi she can eat and how much this translates to how many portions. Um, and then she says, in the case of Minamata disease, people were receiving about uh, 12,000 micrograms, and then she compares it to how much is in um, a pound, or a gram of, of ahi, and then converted that to how many portions of ahi she would need to eat to get into this type of level of having mercury poisoning. So I really liked, she did a really good job with this piece and picked up on it. Um, so this, I think, was really nice. And here's someone who picked up on the increase, you know, so it was increasing at 51% uh, change, and so by 2018, we would be up to 0.5 parts per million, and then she also very nicely says, you know, this means that you can then consume less ahi if the, if the mercury levels are rising, so she's able to identify that, that uh, relation. So those are some, some examples, and so um, this is an example where I really just picked out two. So what I did was, it was a summer class, it was in five weeks, and so I did five mini projects, and each one I picked out two different aspects of the rubric that I wanted them to address. Um, so just maybe very quickly. So the next one, this is one that I did with an Excel spreadsheet. So is bachelor's degree worth the price? So I gave them four hypothetical students, one who's just graduating from high school and starts working right away, another one who graduates in four years from university and takes so much student loans, another one who takes um, seven years but less student loans and compare sort of lifetime earnings and how they pay back. And so um, doing this with Excel was the, was the best really way, or almost the only way to get them to do all these computations. Um, and so there's a lot of assumptions. So in here I was looking at the assumptions. This part of the rubric is often one of the hardest ones to get the students to do. Um, and so, um, yeah, so this one was focused on the application and the analysis, like what do the numbers mean, and then also the assumptions that we were going into this, to this uh, assignment. So some examples. So here, this first example was a very was what was a common example is that students were usually able to pick out what the assumptions were. So um, the salaries were the same starting off at college. Um, so three of the students all graduated college. And they all, we assume that they all have the same starting salary. Um, and they paid their loans at the same rate. Um, we assumed a 2% pay raise over every year. And that they were consecutive. Right? So there's lots of assumptions going in. And most of them were able to sort of identify some assumptions. Um, not many of them were able to identify how the assumptions affects their analysis. And so this is one of a, a sort of successful um, use of that. So here she said, it's not the best idea to assume you could make this much money or that these numbers are exact, but if we're talking about comparison, these assumptions maybe are, are um, reasonable, right? So she said, it's meant to show how much of a difference having a college degree versus a non-college degree, right? And so this is, I mean, again, it's also Math 100, so it's not a super high level of thinking that we're trying to get them to do, but being able to get them to say a little bit more, right? if some of them took a break or not, does that affect your overall assessment of the different um, approaches? Does anyone have any questions? So I'll just give one more. So the other one is not Math 100, it was in Calc 4. And I like this example because um, people really think, I think a common misconception is that quantitative reasoning is just math. And so actually in Calc 4, I was asked to submit a quantitative reasoning for the assessment, and I said, that there's not much quantitative reasoning actually in Calc 4. Even though it's math and it's really high level, um, not really high level, but sort of higher level mathematics, there's not a lot of quantitative reasoning. And so I designed this course, or this, this um, assignment for a little bit of a higher level, and actually the math in it is actually a little bit lower than what you would do for Calc 4. So really they're not integrating here, they're just computing the work across a line and approximating the vector field by different points. But 
Um, so this was an example of a Calc 4, so um, maybe some of you guys know that if the Molokai crossing, boats take different routes, right? And so some people say going up north and coming back down is better than just going straight across because the wind kind of goes with you. So I was using this data from windy.com, which is kind of neat and has real-time wind data to compute the work across these different paths. Right? And so again, this is one where I didn't identify one assumption. I had all, it had all parts of the rubric. So there was interpretation, what does it mean to have positive work, what does it mean to have negative work, um, assumptions, you know, what assumptions did we make, and the big one is just, we're assuming it's a constant along each of these legs. Um, and then again, I think what was important is to get them to make a recommendation. Which path is better, and do you think it makes a difference? Um, would you go a little bit further to get that wind force pulling you down versus going straight? So, um, yeah. Yes? What's the answer? Ah, <laughs> uh, good. It depends on the day. If, if, the, if, if the wind is blowing, it does make sense to go up north. So, my, uh, my, my coach was very happy because he's kind of an old school guy and he says, yes, yes, this is better. And so I was able to show him the math and he was very happy that he was correct. Yeah, and so I gave them, this was another one, um, where maybe it's low, I guess it would be considered low stakes. So I let them each pick whatever day. So Windy T um, takes a week, it holds a week of data. And so they could pick kind of whatever day they liked during the week. And so to make it an individual, they did it in a group, but I had each of them pick a different day to do. And so if you have a, a, like a blowing trade wind, that's much better if it's flat then, of course. And actually that particular week we did, we had a couple days that had come then it's, it's not as good. And this also, um, I built them an Excel spreadsheet. And this one has a, nice, a really interesting, again, uh, probably you guys all know this, and mathematicians don't know this, but the hard part is when you actually are trying to use the data. So for example, the, the Windy gives you the bearing of your paths, but it, it's taking the, the angle from north, and then the wind direction is the angle from so the wind direction is coming from the east. Anyway, the, tr the trigonometry actually was one of the hardest parts of doing this because of the way that it's given, your data has been given. So this is another example that shows the students that um, you know, when you're using a real world scenario, it's not just, it's motivating, that's all very nice, but also you come into problems that you don't expect. So we'd like to have you spend almost the most, basically the, almost the rest of the time period uh, thinking about your own assignment and talking with others about possible assignment ideas. So there are guiding questions here on the green sheet, but these questions are, are just if you need help. Like you might not need these questions. You might be able to just jot down an assignment without these guiding questions. So if you could take say five minutes to jot down an assignment. But if you're stuck, then you can start skimming some of these questions to help get you going. And of course, Sarah and I, we can come around and help you. So after about five minutes, see if there's someone else in the room who's finished, and then maybe do a, not maybe, definitely do a pair and share. Hear what they're gonna do, they hear what you're gonna do, and see if you guys can improve upon what each other are doing, or maybe you have questions for them, okay? So five minutes, find a partner if somebody else is finished, okay. and let us know if you need help. We encourage you to use something called a signature assignment or a shared assignment. And basically it means that the faculty who are teaching the course, they all agree to target the same QR skills, and in this case it will be the Foundation's Quantitative Reasoning skills, but there may be more. It uses a similar criteria for grading, using the same grading criteria so you agree on standards and what you're looking for. And then you're, you're going to try to use the same format. So like you're all going to use worksheets or you're all going to use short answer exams or you're all going to use essays and so forth. And the reason that you do this is because when it comes time for the end of the semester or after a year that's passed, if you've given similar assignments and evaluated students in the same way, then you can really talk about what students did well on, what are they still struggling on, 
right? You've had, the faculty have had a shared experience and then can talk with other faculty about what worked and what didn't work. It gives it, it makes it much easier for you to talk about the curriculum in a way that moves you forward. And the other side benefit is that you have something to say to the foundations board when you reapply because they will ask you what you're doing in terms of reflecting on the course. <laughs> Resources, these are all listed on your handout. There's a, a website at Manoa that has the hallmarks, history, etc. And uh, this Carleton College Science Education Resource Center, they have a lot of assignment ideas. Some of these others have assignment ideas too. You can contact the Quantway uh, Statway people. They will send you curricula. These are prior or pre-100, but it might give you ideas. Okay, So just some resources for you. And then, Please, before you go, take a moment to fill out our evaluation form. We use the results. So whatever you tell us on this, it will be anonymous, and we will use these results to do what we do better. So take a moment, and you can just leave this on your table or leave it on the uh, sign-in table, but um, thank you in advance for filling that out. If you have any questions, uh, please come up and see Sarah. And me, uh, I know we're out of time, so if you want us to talk with you more here, we can, or we're available mm -hmm. after today. Yes, yeah, my email, Monica's email, happy to talk about it. So thank you so much for coming. We appreciate your time.